Hi, um, I'm Dr. Bannon, and uh, I would like to introduce myself a little bit differently. I am the dad of six children, 15 grandchildren, and two more on the way. So that's my primary function. And I did that with my Asperger, so don't ask me how that happened. Uh, I guess some things come intuitively. Every week. So uh, with the, uh, I would like to share, this is my pictograph outline of my speech. And I took this from Mark Twain, who used to do this during his speeches. So I'm following him, and I'm very visual. Once I went to read Temple Brandon's book, uh, Thinking in Pictures, I realized I was totally a visual learner, and I didn't even know that. And this was at whatever, I don't even know what age it was. And uh, I just remember everything everywhere I go. And how to get there, I don't remember the names of anything, but I can get there. So today we're going to talk about, and I'm going to set my little alarm here, so I don't go crazy on you. I'm on uh, Guadalajara time right now. I came, I left Guadalajara at 4 a.m. So I am. I took a swim to do at the hotel and ate some good food and took a nap for my sensory issues. So I think I'm all right for a couple hours. We'll see. If I make a real big mistake, you'll know why. So uh, the book that we're talking about is this big sucker here. It's called, this toolkit just came out through Jessica Kingsley in London. Now this is like a reference book for anyone transitioning. The original book, what's nice about that, the little one here, is that it, um, it's more like stories. It's easy read. And I, I I'm, due to my Asperger's, I'm very efficient and I don't waste time and I don't want to have anything to do with anything that's complicated or textbook like. So these books are full of practical stories, tips, uh, activities, everything. They're really references books. But this one's nice because it's just like a good read. You can get it on Amazon for eight dollars used, but don't buy it new. But <laughs> if you're gonna get it. But what I was gonna say is it's really all stories about executive functioning, sensory integration, social thinking, all college age students and my own stories mixed in. So it's an easy read and you'll say, yeah, it's just like me or it's like my kid or that's like this kid I have in school or whatever. And so you'll learn something from that. But this book was a spinoff from that one and this one is the one that has the meat of our curriculum for the last 32 years, uh, accumulation. And, I, and I, I took memos that I wrote over the years and turned them into you know, advice and stuff and made it into the book. And there's 52 staff and students who have contributed to this book and 10 or 12 experts in the expert section. So it's really a, cross, a really good reference book for having a problem in any area. You can look at it and say, oh, okay. So to get back to our pictograph. So these are the chapters of the book, okay? And the first one is the diagnosis area. So if you don't get this part and um, and you don't really get it at all. You know, that's the problem. So how many times, for me, we were talking about this beforehand, when I was diagnosed, it was like explaining second grade, explaining how my, my kids said, yeah, dad, that explains this and this and this. So it was more of a social understanding thing for me. And, and to have a name on it and be able to understand that I could change it was really important. And I have changed it quite a bit. So our saying is that you know, obviously the book is called Made for Good Purpose too. You were made for good purpose and you're inherently valuable. You weren't made, dis you're, not a dis you're not disabled, you're not dysfunctional. You just have a different learning style and it's different than most people and it's more advanced than most, a lot of people. There's things that I can do that my children cannot do and they're neurotypical, all of them. But they're smarter than me and many, and socially, they're all smarter than me socially. But I'm a lot smarter than them in other ways. You know, I'm going to intuitively get things that they don't sometimes. So anyway, so the thing is, our students come in, all of you guys have worked with them, and the parents have turned themselves inside out, trying to find every therapy in the world for them, right? And then they come in and they, they don't understand, they don't even understand their diagnosis. You say, well, what does that mean to have Asperger's? Well, I have some social issues or something. And so, if you don't know who you, who you are, how can you, how can you go out in the world and effectively advocate for yourself? If you had cancer, you'd find out, wouldn't you? So it's not a disease. 
So we have to teach them through self-assessment and all of our assessments what you know, what kind of learner they are, the visual learner, verbal learner, auditory learner, you know, what are, what are they in each area? Social, what are their assets in the social area? What are their assets in the, in the sensory area? What are the areas they need to remediate? And then we go about doing that with them and set them loose in the world. So this pyramid, what does S stand for? Anyone have a clue? That's the learning pyramid. The learning period means that I can sit up here and lecture you all I want, and that's going to be about 5% effective. I can give you a visual, and that would be about 20% effective. I can show you by teaching you by practice, that would be like 40% effective. But guess what? If I have you and you work together in a dyad, and I show you what I want you to do and you teach each other, that's going to be like 90% effective. So schools are set up the wrong way for a lot of us. You know, I would learn experientially much faster than I'm going to learn through lecture and books and, you know, videos and stuff. Videos are more effective for me, actually. So that's what that means. So we have to start, the bottom of the pyramid is where we want to be, a 90% in everything we do. Okay, what does SIS stand for in that little donkey there? Anyone have a clue? Come on, you got to guess. This is creativity time. I want to keep you awake. It's, uh, what is it? <laughs> it's, uh, that's my, uh, you know, social interpersonal skills. And uh, one of the things I came up with was the donkey rule, and it's helped students learn um, skills that they can translate uh, and have really good decision-making skills. Because my social thinking ability is very low. Like, I have trouble figuring out what to do in a lot of the areas. And so, I use the donkey rule. If five of my mentors say it's a donkey, and I'm still saying it's a horse, then I'm not going to be a jackass and I'm going to do what they said. <laughs> and that's how I have six CIPs around the country. Because I use the donkey rule. Because I don't know how to work with uh, contractors or to you know, negotiate a cam on a lease. Yeah, I won't even tell you what that is. And so I had to use the donkey rule to find out information and to learn how to have a life that worked. So that's just one of the areas covered in the book in that area. What's a PCP, anyone know? Come on, at least guess. It's not a drug for any of you. Okay, it's a person-centered plan. And if you don't have one for your students, you should be doing them right here in Cumberland Academy. Because you can sit down with them, they take all their information, and they make a three-month plan, a six-month plan, three-year plan, and they look at every area, social thinking, executive functioning, sensory integration, academics, careers. And guess what? If you make a plan, you're halfway there. That's how it works. If I say I'm going to start a Dairy Queen, down in this town. If I just commit to it, I'm already halfway there. And that sounds ridiculous, but it's true. You have to have the vision, has to lead. Backwards planning. The vision of having Cumberland Academy came first, the building came later, right? And the teachers came later, the equipment came later. The vision leads all the time. It would be good if we had that politics right now, right? So it's, that's all I'm going to say in that area. <laughs> I'll stay out of it. Uh, that's actually good social thinking skills on my part here. <laughs> also, part of that PCP is doing portfolios. We were talking a little bit about that. From age five, you know, your artwork, your, if you have a recommendation from the town when you did some yard work for the summer forum and volunteered, everything goes in that and online or, or actual, visit, you know, real portfolio because you're building that kind of a resume, right? And a career. And Temple Grandin, when she went into the, uh, uh, when, whoever read the book, Temple Grandin or some movie, okay. When she went into the slaughterhouse, she's the goofiest woman in the world. I've taken her to lunch twice, she doesn't even say thank you. And the woman is whacked, but she's incredibly smart. And to get, we can't pass the interview, right? Can't pass the interview. And so here's the problem. She puts her, her images of the 
with, you know, how she wants to do the slaughterhouses in front of them. And then she starts to explain how they're going to save money because less cattle are going to die in the delousing pits because they, the way she arranged it was she got in there and saw what they see so they're not afraid, blah, 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 blah. Then she got the job. And now most of the places in the world are using her design, right? But that only happened because of the portfolio. That's, she couldn't pass an interview. If you sat down and talked to her, you'd say, well, it's crazy, why would I have her work here? My farmhands would never get along with this woman. So that's the problem for us, a lot of us, right? I have to use my glasses so I can see what I'm doing. Okay, what's the next one there? HS4W, any ideas? Okay, this is the eight skills for work. And that's in this book, and they are communication, teamwork, problem solving, using critical thinking skills, initiative and leadership, planning and organizing, self-management, willingness to learn, and technology. These are the eight areas, and what we're doing with this book, it's the biggest chapter in this book, it's the best chapter. What we're gonna do is, we just submitted a proposal to make a separate workbook out of it, which people can use and just take it and use it, because that is the primary issue in the whole country. Now, I've been saying it for 20 years, that the issue is not college, it's the other skills. It's, it's uh, social skills, it's being able to hold a relationship, it's being able to uh, talk to your employer, etc. So those are really important. I'm going to move on because I'm being slow. So what's the CI? Anyone know? Take a guess. Community integration. It's useless to stay in offices and classrooms. The kids at Cumberland, and I'm saying it right out loud, they need to be out there, especially the high school kids, out in the community doing internships, being out there learning, using the buses, traveling, and understanding the world, because that is the hardest part for our kids. They're smarter than the average, but trying to get them to do it after college, it's a disaster. They can get a degree, and then they can't, they can't function. And it's a real problem. And, um, I'll talk about that if I have more time later because I have a really good story about it. So what's the next one? UV. Oh wait, no one's even guessing one time. Ultraviolet. Okay, good guess, now you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's universal values. So obviously we've been remiss in our country teaching common values of respect, you know, not stealing. Can we all agree whether we're Muslim or Christian not to steal? Yes. Can we teach that in schools? Yes. So it has to be taught. And we have, you know, smart kids, but a lot of times they don't get it about the values that we want them to have. And what's the next one? PMP. Anyone have an idea? It's a peer mentoring program. Every program, every school, you need to teach peer mentoring where they can actually do conflict resolution with each other. And they learn to do it together by themselves. Boys Town used to do this way back with Father Flanagan. They had a little student court and everything. They need to learn how to do that for themselves. It's one thing to have a nice, great school and programs, but if we're just running the whole show, how are they learning how to be adults and work in the world and have leadership skills, etc.? So we need to teach, let them learn that from them, each other. Uh, the next one is a book going out to an eye. Anyone have it? That's curriculum integration. So this book, if you want to use this book, you can integrate it into a school in several ways. You can put it into one class. You could have a class on this book. Or you could have all your teachers learn the book and go to the training, or just do it without going to the training, and use it in the whole school and implement all of the principles throughout the school. So that's different ways of using it. The next one is called, uh, what is that? A and E stand for, anyone? It's not arts and entertainment. It's assessment and evaluation. So we need to assess students thoroughly when they come in. How many people have had a sensory profile done on them? No. Nope. And so all your students here at the school should have a sensory profile. So they know what their strong points are and their sensory issues, what their weak points are. I know you're doing a lot of things with lights and you know, time, you know, having them have time out if they need it and stuff like that. There's other things you can do too, a lot of other things. So those are really important. And the colleges won't do it. So if you don't know how to do that for yourself when you go to college, 
Just like I went in the pool and took a nap, because I've been up since actually 3.30, and the freaking dogs started barking in my neighborhood in Mexico. So I had to take, learn how to take care of myself so I don't have meltdowns or say something really stupid up here, right? And so they have to learn the same thing. Okay, what's the next one there? What does that look like? Two people talking to each other? That's in their own words. We have a section in the book where students and staff have written in their own words their stories and what works for them and what doesn't work for them. And the next one we have someone like an expert at the same blah, blah, blah. That's the chapter on the experts speak. And that's where we have Stephen Shore, Brenda Smith-Miles on hidden curriculum and all that in the book. So they're talking about the areas, self-disclosure, all these other areas that are really pertinent to, the, uh, to everyone. The other one is simply a 12, that's the 12 chapters of the book. And the sombrero, what does that have to do with? Anyone? That is a sombrero, not a spaceship. <laughs> Just a bad sombrero. That has to do with our training programs that we have, and we have some really cool ones. We have them in Mexico. And it's a leisure and learn program. We have some of these up there if you want to see it. It's really cool. It's set up, it's like a mini masters in, in transition for your child, or your, uh, if you're an educator, or a psychologist, or a parent. It's perfect for you to go to something like this. We'll have them in the US too, but this is where we're starting it. There's one in July and one in December. And they're one week long, and what they are is leisure and learn. So you come, you work from 8 in the morning till 2 in the afternoon. Then, after that, you can go to see Guadalajara, go horseback riding, or go on the lake, or whatever the hell you want. And what's nice about it is it's cheaper in Mexico. We can do it there, and it's beautiful. It's in Ajijic, where I live. It's an amazing community. It's had a 100-year history of art galleries, Americans, uh, Coming down there, writers like Dylan was there, and um, song, you know, people with music and everything. Uh, it's, it has a very history in Mexico. It's very much a diverse community, and it's a very nice place to visit on its own, much less have a training there. So this will give people an opportunity in a group of 15 to get an intensive go through with the book. You get the book with it, and I'm like an infomercial now. But what happens is you also get a personal time on the last day where you can talk individually with one of us trainers about your situation and come, come out with your own person-centered plan for what you want to do in your work or with your student or whatever. Okay, so that's what we're doing down there. The, um, let's see if I missed anything there. So the other CIP, this is not standing for College Internship Programs, it's standing for Constantly in Progress. And that was from a student in Brevard who said it at a parent meeting when he was talking about his own program. And he is now a staff member at Brevard. He actually works there. And I happened to come down to the center. And I, when I go to the centers, I feel free to go anywhere I want and see anything I want and walk in anywhere I want. And I do. Because I feel like they should be able to handle that. So I went right in in the morning to the reframing at eight o'clock, and he was teaching it. I didn't even know he was even teaching it. And this is a perfect example of the learning pyramid. Pyramid. What's the learning pyramid say again? It's better to do what? Peer to peer. Here's a student, a former student, teaching reframing to students. He was better than anyone I've seen over the last uh, ten years of our autism programs and our uh, our CIP programs the way they are now. Anyway, so he was better than anyone. And he was dynamic, he had them just really making it apropos all the time. So, and involving them in every step of the way. So I think that using uh, him was, was ideal, you know, in a sense. So, um, the last one is by the saying I started uh, when I was, I'm going to turn this off so it doesn't go off. I have one minute left. Um, when I was in uh, starting my program in Berkeley, I was frustrated walking down the street with my cell phone, my rental car, and me trying to figure out how to, where to start the program, where the building would be, how to get a telephone system, who I was going to hire, and I'm like getting like overwhelmed. And I said to myself, Michael, you need to think positive. And I look over on the storefront windowsill, and there's a stone that says think positive on it. So I pick it up, 
and I put it in my pocket, and it serves as a sensory device for me for three days to keep me positive. Every time I felt it, I said, okay, think positive. I kept switching back. And so I started making them. And put, I put it back on the windowsill. I put them in bathrooms. I gave them to people at conferences. In fact, Matt, I gave one him like four or five years ago when he says, still have your stone. <laughs> and uh, people all over the world have been giving them to. So it's been like a mantra of, uh, you know, here's, here's the deal. Don't we have a choice every day whether we want to be positive or negative? As adults, we know that we do, right? So I'm just going to mention this personal thing, not to like shock you, but I have four brothers and sisters that are dead, two on the spectrum, three suicides, one of them here in Georgia three or four months ago from alcohol after 30 years of a slow suicide. So I could have every reason to feel negative if I want every day of my life. But my mom made lemonade. She, she, she's the one who had to go through a lot more than I did. Three, four of her kids, yeah. But she had a positive spirit about all of it. So, you know, I'm a survivor of all that, and I'm a survivor of my own Asperger's. I probably could have been a suicide too as an Asperger's kid in high school. I was pretty darn down. I couldn't understand why my best friends in grade school were getting in cars right across the street and going off with their new friends. And I was there in my house. I had no idea to pick up a phone, didn't know how to talk to people, didn't know how to initiate, say, you know, hey, you want to go somewhere and do this? I had no clue. And I just got more and more depressed playing Simon and Garfunkel. I am a rock, I am an island, over and over and over that summer. And luckily that would make you suicidal by itself. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to pass it on to the rest of our panel and thanks for coming.